Hi everyone. Welcome to the virtual uh, League of New Hampshire Craftsman's Fair uh, studio demonstrations. Uh, today is the Saturday before the end of the fair, so this is it. The big push is on and we're all excited about that our viewers have come to see us and have also come to see us at the virtual fair. Now, all side notes have come in with everything throughout the week. We have communication from the League, and the League has talked to us about how great the organization is. And we all believe in the organization because the organization supports local uh, juried craftsmen uh, who are masters of their craft. And we always need sponsors and people to join as patrons to be a part of the organization. So if you haven't seen that part yet, go to their website, which is nhcrafts.org, and you will probably find some of that information. Um, it's a great organization, and they have many different levels for you to be able to join. Uh, other than that, uh, I had a question last week after my demo, which was on Sunday. Now, during the week, a lot of people got to see Maureen making a moon jar and then continuing the moon jar to decorate it in that. But I had a question, and the question was, how do you make handles for your mugs? And my students love me for this because I think handles are one of the most complicated things to do. They look simple, they're not. To make them feel good in the hand is complicated. To make them uh, usable is also complicated. Now, I am just cleaning my bottom, which disturbs a lot of people, because I love to just clean a little roughly on the outer edge. And this is how I would be finishing up a pot. I'm going to smooth off the bottom and clean that. I'm going to go around the edge and clean up what I just scraped away because everything I do is perfectly, perfectly round. Then I'm just going to rub my hand on the bottom and then roll the edge to lift the pot up off the surface. So now I have a nice smooth bottom that you can see. And I'll do that again because we're going to put two handles on. And for the handles, I'm going to make three of them to choose two. Now, when I teach classes, I have a lot of students that uh, like to make handles and they make one. And then they have no choice but to put on one. And that one becomes not a great choice always. Uh, for them, it is a learning curve. But I always believe if you don't know how to do something, make more than one. Um, it works out really well in that. Now, I'm also going to roll this one, and then we have that bottom again. Now, one of the things that I did not bring over was a serrated rib. Uh, so excuse me for a second. Oh, here we go. This is a serrated rib. It has little sharp teeth um, in that on it. Um, by the way, I'm trying to figure out where the camera is. It's right in front of me and it's off to my side. So I'm going to take the serrated rib and I'm going to score the surface. Now I haven't pulled the handle yet, but I will. And I'm scoring it. Then I'm going to score right down here. Now, if you notice, the mug is not decorated yet. If you look at most of my mugs, they have patterns all the way around it. I put the decoration on prior to the handle so that it's a part of it. But uh, for this demonstration, I wanted a clean surface so that you could see how the pot is being scored. Now, again, I'm just cutting line into the pot. If you don't score the pot, now it will end up, the handle will be stuck to the pot, but it's just kind of glued a little bit to the pot. By scoring, the, pot, the handle melts into the pot. 
and becomes a part of the pot. Without it, it doesn't. So a lot of times people buy manufactured mugs and they buy pieces like that and they can't figure out why the handle fell off. Well, if you look, it may be because it was just stuck on and the glaze is actually what's holding it in place. But I love to score my pots. Now, the other thing is I teach, and I have to say this just in case any of my students are watching. I am sitting and I'm pulling a handle. I never recommend sitting and pulling a handle. It is better to stand so you can get a really good view. So you're going to get a view of my wonderful bucket, and I'm going to hold it up in my hands and almost up to my face so that I can see the shape of the handle. So what I'm making is an elephant trunk. So I'm just putting it down and pulling. I'm not, I'm clasping my fingers so that there's this nice little like round circle or kind of oval shape. And then I'm going to take my thumb and I'm going to push the clay down and push it out and make it look like there's a V. And I'm going to keep moving it and working it around, smoothing off any edges that are sharp and working it with my fingers. Once I get that shape, I'm going to wet this side and I'm going to push the handle down and let it hang. I'm going to pull three of these. We have a question. Oh, I'm supposed to ask you guys, do you have any questions? So if you do, please type them in and Maureen will ask me or she likes to write a lot, so she may even answer you back through a text. So, or whatever method we're using here, which is similar to texting and that. So, please feel free to ask questions. Now, I'm going to keep doing the same thing. I'm going to push it out and manipulate it and make it longer. Check and make sure that it's perfectly nicely round. Because one of the nice parts about a handle is when I first started, I used to make them within this crook of my thumb, and they were pointed on that side. And the other side was round, and people would pick them up and say that the edge was sharp. Uh, it only take me lots of years to believe it, lots of critiquing um, with a master craftsman in my house, um, and... I started to manipulate and move the clay to make it rounder. Uh, each potter makes their handles differently. If you look at Maureen's handles and mine, if you go to our website, which is um, Mills and Maureen Mills and Stephen Zoldak Potters, or Mills and Zoldak Potters, and sliptrail.com. And sliptrail so if you look those things up, you will find us and you'll see the difference in styles and that. Now I'm going to keep pulling it down and manipulating. Each handle is unique. So even if I keep pulling, if I pulled 30 of these, there would be 30 different styles of handles. Now I'm going to lay this one down. And now I have them. Clean your hands off, because the last thing you want is your hands to start drying when you're putting handles on, because that they get kind of chunky, and it ends up on the handle, and then you have to try to clean it up. And I have this favorite word I use. It's called futzing. And you futz to clean it up, and then you start pushing and prodding. You get the handle too wet, it starts to slump, all kinds of things. Now, some potters like to wait a while, let the handle stiffen up. I don't do that. Uh, I'm going to pick a handle. I'm going to cut it with my knife. I'm going to slice downward, but I have to put my hand in front of it. Otherwise, it's going to fall down. So I just sliced it, 
like so. And now I'm going to score across the surface and I'm going to wipe away a piece of clay and give it kind of like a roundness to it. Now I can take my finger and put water here and here and now I've got a wet surface to work with and I'm going to push the handle onto the pot like so and then slowly work it on and then I'm going to pick it up like so and then gently massage it. I'm not going to keep overworking it. I'm going to smooth underneath the edge and then I'm going to drape the handle down and look at it. Now with my students, I look at it with them and I say, look at the handle from the side view until you think it looks comfortable to your hand. And then don't futz a lot, just clean up your edges like so. I'm going to pinch off the bottom and then just lightly clean up these edges with a little bit of water. And that's how we make the handle. Now we'll do that again. If I want to, I will look at it. I'm going to lift it up just a little bit so it has a different feel. Lift it up a little bit. Now Maureen is the director today. So if you're looking at what I'm doing and that, now she's got it so you can see what is happening. So I'm putting my finger in there and cleaning it up and smoothing it off. And that's the way I put on a handle. Now what I'm going to do next is cut another one. I'm going to score it. After a while, I'm going to come back to these mugs and I'm going to look at my handle and I'm going to clean it up even a little more. So I'm not done with this handle yet. I'm only at the beginning stages of finishing it. So when you put a handle on, it's not done just because you put it on. There's coming back to it and cleaning it up in that. Now another method is I dip the handle in the water, I lightly tap both parts, and then again I just push the clay lightly and gently on to the pot, like so. Then I turn it upside down, I'm going to start to smooth off that edge again, clean it up, and then slowly work it so that it's even. And then I'm going to pull the handle just a little bit and that, because think of when you make like 30 of these. By the time you go back to number one, it is a little bit drier. So I want it to bend easily. And then I'm going to bend it around and down, look at the shape, move it up if I need to, or down. And I'm moving this one up just a little bit. I'm going to push my finger in and then pinch. Clean up the edges, like so. Take a little bit of water, work that edge in. I'm not futzing with them. I'm just gently touching the piece. This handle's a little bit tighter, but I like the look of it onto the pot. And it should feel really comfortable. Um, I've said to my students that you can't just think of making a mug because it's a mug. You have to think about it. Somebody's going to use this to drink with. And there's the mouth edge. There's the handle. There's the bottom. There's the texture or the warmth. Because when you put a cup of coffee or tea in this, or even hot chocolate, people hold the cup. And they want to know how it feels. So there's more to making a mug than just making a mug. There's a lot of process. And most pottery is about process. So now that we got the handles on those, we're going to move on and we're going to now make pie plates. And why? Because everybody, I think, likes pie. 
if they don't like apple pie, they might like chocolate pie. They might like, uh, you know, peach pie. A cobbler can be made in the pie plate. You name it, you can make it in a pie plate. Our pie plates go into an oven, and they can go into a microwave, um, and that. Uh, so you can use them to bake a pie, um, and that. Now, I know how to make a pie. Uh, just a little tidbit of information, because I've been, I've been known to tell stories. Well, the story is, I make pie plates. I don't make pie. I have made pie. I make quiche, though. That I do. My wife makes the pies. So um, one thing you must learn, potters are experimenters. You can't experiment with a pie crust. It does not work unless you really spend a lot of time and have people who are patient with your pie crust. Otherwise, there is competitions and display. So now what we will do is get into making the pie plates. I wedged up my clay earlier, which is taking the clay and it's kind of like kneading bread. Now, and that. I, I wedged my clay prior to and if you've ever kneaded bread, it means you're putting air into uh, the pot, into the clay. Again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I uh, don't mind answering them. Oh, by the way, I hope that answered the uh, question for the handles. Uh, if you weren't here when I made them last time, I missed you. If you were here then, I'm glad you're back looking in on what we're doing. Now, what I'm going to do here is push the clay out. I have just centered the clay. And I've been making pots for over 30 years. I think I've said this a few times. So I have a rhythm and a system down to how I make my pots uh, and that. Now, what I've just done is I've centered the clay, and what I'm going to do is push down, find the bottom of my pot. Now, in the beginning, a lot of potters use a needle tool, and they probe, they stop the wheel, stick the needle in, and measure the bottom. Over time, you get a feel for the thickness. If you notice, all of my fingers are not on a sponge. And that's because I want to feel where the clay is and how deep it is. So now what I'm going to do is open it. And I'm just going to pull it out to the outer edge. And then round that edge off like so. Now this is a long expansion. So I'm going to spend some time compressing the clay and pushing it back and forth to get that clay all compressed down to the bottom of the wheel head. And I'm using a thing that is called a bat. Now, there are different kinds of bats. There's the bat that is the animal, and then there's the baseball bat, and then there is the potter's bat. Now, these are names where they all came from. Traditional names for pottery have been around forever, so we all don't always know where they came from and why. This one is called a bat, and it's just a round disc, like so, that I'm working on. There are plastic ones, there are plaster ones, and then there are ones that are made out of MDF board that loves to be wet. Now I'm just going to pinch the clay and pull it up and make a wall. And I'm going to do that again. I'm going to slow my wheel down and go up. I'm also going to tilt it outward. Now the first one is never as good as my second, third, fourth, or fifth one. 
every time you do this, there's a warm-up period. Now, some potters don't need warming up, but some do. Now, I'm going to take a rip, and I'm just going to push on the outside and smooth off the edge. Like, pie plates tend to be about 10 inches to inches in diameter, give or take a few. Uh, they're a little bit deeper than normal, so they're not your average pie plate. Uh, but they do make really good deep dish pie plates. And that. Also, I'm going to take the rib before I go up, and I'm going to smooth off the bottom because I want my surface to be smooth. So I'm using a wooden rib today. Uh, I was using, when I was cleaning up the mugs, uh, a plastic yellow rib. And this is a teardrop rib. Um, I love these because they give me the curve of a bowl. They make really nice plates. And it, it saves me the time of running around trying to find different ribs when I'm in the process of doing this. So now what I'm going to do is just push down inside. Now, I was an apprentice at a place called Silver Dollar City in Branson, Missouri. And when I was there, I had to make the pie plates. I made a lot of objects that other pot the master potters didn't want to make. So I got to do some of the fun things, pie plates, uh, candle holders, things that were the unusual, um, and that. And the master potter showed me how to make pie plates, and he always made them with a sharp 45-degree angle. And I could never do that. And then we moved here to New Hampshire, and I started working at Strawberry Bank, the historical museum where Maureen and I had our own shop. We were sole proprietors within the museum. And I got to look at the 17th century pie plates. And they were making them the way I was making them. And I went, wow, that's cool. And then I finally figured out why. Because if you watch old time movies, you'll notice sometimes, like I'm talking 40s, 30s, uh, and that, You'll see a lot of Westerns where they have the pie and the guy picks the pie up and holds it in his hand because they were cooked differently. They put different ingredients so they weren't runny. But the pie plates were rounded, so the pie just slipped out. And that's what it was. The pie just slipped out of the dish because they would. it was done on redware, and redware didn't like sharp knives because it was a soft glazed pot. They're great pots to work with. I have a lot of friends who make them and I even use a redware pie plate and it is fantastic to use. But stoneware is a very durable clay and that's what we use. So now I've made the shape and I've got the pie plate out. I'm now going to have the fun part and I'm going to do several steps now. Um, one is I'm going to actually use my wire and cut it first because if I don't have a bottom there's no sense going any further and I have a bottom. Now I'm going to do the famous technique it's called thumb fluting. It's exciting, it is thrilling, it is chilling. And I am just pressing my fingers into the clay and working. It kind of, it's really kind of fun. Making the thumb flutes is kind of like making a pitcher or a spout for a pitcher or a kind of creamer. The only difference is I'm not trying to make these pour. If I was making a pitcher, I would be working and refining the outer edge. I want this to have a little thickness on the outer edge. And this is um, a technique that I learned when I was an apprentice. And I love this because it gives you a place to press in your crust. 
Or if you sometimes like to roll your crust inward, it gives you this beautiful decorative edge on the outside and that. So I'm just cleaning up a little bit and making them a little bit smoother by running my thumb over the edge. Now the gentleman who taught me how to do this had broke his thumb and his thumb was huge so when he did it he had this gigantic flutes going all the way around it was really neat. I never could match what he did so I learned how to use spatial relationship to make the edge of the pot so that it is equal all the way around. But there is the human element in this so each pie plate is going to be unique. Now again, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. There is no pressure though, just because I keep asking you to do that. All right, so please just enjoy what you see. Now, what I'm gonna do now is put a stamp pattern on this. And this is my stamp. It's uh, been cut out and it's a flower and I have a smaller one so if you look at the pie plate back here I'm kind of going to do that pattern into this pie plate so where did I put my big jars did I leave my big jars over there so what I'm looking for right now is my big jar of blue uh, to use and white. So uh, Maureen and I make our own slips and we put them in these plastic containers so that they won't dry out. There was spongeware and that's kind of basically what I'm doing all the way back in the 1700s and earlier. There's been stamping on pots since the beginning of history and the biggest one would have been caveman because he would have used his fingers or he would have taken and used a leaf or a flower or something and put the clay on it and pressed it onto a cave and that. So those cave paintings are early stampware but if you look at some of their pots they had patterns on them. Native American pots used slips uh, Greek pottery took it to a whole new level. Uh, unbelievable design. South America. Slips are in every culture everywhere. I use the technique and I do a very simple, simple pattern. So this is going to be really complicated. I'm just going to push down onto the pot with this design and make the design with a pattern in it. It is fun, it's unique, and I like, I like it because I can do multiple patterns. I'm doing this on a wet pot today, so it has a totally different feel, and normally I do this on a leather hard pot like the mugs. If you looked at the mugs, they were kind of brownish looking, not shiny, and this one is shiny, so it has a whole different feel to it. Now this is my smaller sponge. I'm going to take that and we're going to put a few smaller flowers in between the others. <coughs> Excuse me. And that. So I'm just going to stamp that on like so. Then we're going to use some other slips that are in a bottle. These are our trailing bottles. Traditionally they were made out of turkey quills, cow's horns, uh, glued the turkey quill into it. They made them out of copper. They had a, uh, a copper smith make them. Uh, they would tip them back and forth. So think of tilting something and using gravity to pour the liquid onto the surface. So what I'm going to do now is push the clay out onto the surface and 
draw with it. Now, remember how I said in caveman's time, all the way even into the 1300s, these are the greatest tools that were ever made. You just use it and press on to the pot. And voila, you now have a pattern of a dot to a center of a flower. Then I'm going to take a, that was my black slip. The first slip was my blue one. And now I'm going to use a brown slip. So this one, normally I like to check sometimes. And this one is an iron base. And the real fun part is lately, when the brown slip sits around, there's this thing called magnetism. And somehow the iron likes to find itself. And it goes back to being a clump. Today I'm lucky. It's not doing that. So now what I'm going to do is draw on the surface with the needle tool onto the pot, like so. When these get fired in a bisque kiln, they will all be melted together, basically. The, the slips I make are made out of a porcelain-based clay. So they will melt together and become one. Um, also, again, back to the human element. There are unique characteristics to my pot. I have this whole thing about perfection and design, but I also know men were not meant to work like cogwheels or draw circles like uh, compasses, and the gentleman who said that was named John Ruskin uh, in the 1840s, and he was the teacher of William Morse, who became one of the largest people of the decorative artist art movement during the 1800s to the 20th century, part of the arts and crafts movement. So when you look at a potter, we all try to be perfect, but we are human. Uh, we were not meant to be machines. Now, this is a white slip. And the white slip is going to be used for dots. And also, I have a blue slip. And we're going to back up a little bit because what I would like to do is take the blue slip and put a dot in the center of the big black slip, like so. Now, at Sunapee Fair, normally on the last day when I'm demoing, I ask somebody, what would they like to see me make? Now, this could get creative. And remember, this is going into the realm of the whole world. So be gentle. If you have a pot that you would like to be seen made um, that is simple, I'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, teapots probably complicate it. Cats and rats look the same, so I wouldn't recommend that. But if you have an idea, I'd be happy to try to see if we could do that. But do remember, this is going live out to the whole world, just in case. Hundreds of viewers. Hundreds and hundreds of viewers. So be gentle. So what I'm going to do now is put some white dots onto the surface of the pot, like so. Now once I get these dots on, I'm going to go back into the flowers and I'm going to put dots there as well. So there's going to be dots all over this pot. I love doing dots. Anybody who remembers some of my earlier work when I was more symmetrical and that I had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dots on my pots. Um, now I've gone more asymmetrical. So I have a few less 
on my pots. Now the slip is really wet. It is not drying because it is on a wet surface. Also, the first 5,000 of these is a little complicated. Over time, you, if you study pottery, it will get easier. It's just taking your time to learn how to make the pot. Now, pie plates traditionally were also used Think of people who get married. Today we have marriage licenses, we have a whole court system, all of that. Back in the colonial era, somebody would get married, they would do some of the procedures that are still happening today, but the way you knew you were married was there was a portrait painted of you, or there was something written with your name and the date of your wedding. Lots of pie plates have been found that have dates of people who were married and that gives the date of the wedding. So a lot of times earthenware pie plates were decorative more than functional so that people could see them. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to lift this up and remove it from the wheel head and then we're going to do that again. So that's the pie plate right there. No takers on what to make? No questions yet. Oh, wow. No asks yet. Fantastic. I'm answering all the questions as we go. No. All right, we're going to put the bat down. I am using bat pins to hold this in place. So this is going to be tight to the wheel head and I can throw on it and remove this from the wheel head. Sometimes what I do is I throw a pad of clay down and I can use that to throw, put the bat on, but I won't come back to center if I wanted to. If I do this on this method with the pins, I can always go back to center. So I could work on pots multiple, multiple times. So if you watched Maureen make the moon jar the other day, she could remove that from the wheel head and then put it back on the wheel head and so on and so forth until she gets it to the shape she wanted. And that. The fun part is the potter's wheel is probably one of the oldest tools around. It came probably about the same time somebody tried to invent the wheel uh, because it's round. And so a lot of our uh, gadgets that we have today are made over time and they are all following from that first inventions that were back in the beginning of time. Now again, center the clay. Now, to pot for potters, it is doing multiple, most multiple things. Now, even a studio potter, a lot of times I get that term that I'm a studio potter. Well, a studio potter is a potter that makes the pot from the beginning to the end. A production potter gets to do multiple tasks, but never ever gets to do all the tasks. And then there is a factory potter or industrial potters. They only learn certain parts of the trade, and they don't learn any other parts. That's all they do, and they will do that for most of, of their career and not change. However, in the early years, they would start potters at the simplest level and slowly work them through. And there was a, uh, potters who made these gigantic 30-gallon jugs. Well, they would find those guys, and they would keep taxing them until they made that pot. 
And then that became their job, and that was their only job, was to make these gigantic pots. Uh, in the flower pot industry, that's how they got, they make like those gigantic 30 gallon pots by, on a wheel. Those guys have been trained since the beginning of time to do that. It took 15 years uh, in the early years for a potter to be called a master potter. And prior to that, he would have had to go through the guild system, which is an apprenticeship program. And he would there learn to make the pots. But when he was about 18 to 21, he would go to the guild house for potters and bring in work to demonstrate that he had the skills to be a master craftsman so that he could run a business. If he was not a master craftsman, he was called a journeyman and he had to work for someone else. He could not own his own business. And before you're a journeyman, you are considered an apprentice. Now, we have a different terminology of apprentice kind of today. The idea is the same, but we don't start him at the age of six. So kids would be going to work at the age of six to learn their craft until they were 18 to 21. And then they would become a master craftsman. And there were penalties if you did not follow that system. So even in the factories like Wedgwood and that, they had that apprentice program. And kids were working in the factories all the way up to about 1906. And then they realized kids needed to get an education and start to learn and that. We've changed a lot of that today. Now, if you have questions, really feel free to ask. Now, again, I'm using the rib on the outside, smoothing off the surface. Then I'll take the rib on the inside, and I'll compress the clay again once more. Then I'll take the teardrop. Push it out. Most of the time, I throw pots standing. I'm not normally a sitter when I make my wares. So <clears throat> I love the idea of when I stand to make them because they it gives me better posture to my body. Potters are known to throw out their backs because we lean and slouch into what we do. And it's not good for your body. And if think of throwing, you know, 10 pounds, 15 pounds, 5 pounds. If you have bad posture, you get hurt. Uh, not a good thing to do. Now that I've made that design, I'm going to clean up the water, clean off the edge, smooth it up. Just get a little more of that gunk out of it. And then take my thumb again and go around. Now again, this is my last demo for Sunapi or for the virtual craft fair for the League of New Hampshire Craftsmen. Now, with this, what's going on in the world today, the League decided to go virtual. Because of that virtualness, we are not demonstrating up at Sunapee this year, which is where we would love, all of us would love to be, to be able to see you. Now, next year, we might be there. So, you know, Always the good part is we're constantly growing at the league and the league membership. And if you are a craftsman and you believe you have some really good qualities in your craft that you are doing, you should contact the league and see if you want to be a part of it because that's another way of supporting this organization 
is becoming a part of this. It's a jury process. So think of it this way. You go to, you bring your work, and you bring about 12 to 15 pieces, and you put them on a table, and your peers, the craftsmen in your craft, look at your work, and then they give you a critique. And that critique is valuable. When Maureen and I joined almost 30 years ago to the league, it was so interesting because we were surprised we got in. We were so new at doing clay. We're critical of our work. So we were being very critical of our work and the way it was put together. And they looked at my work and they said, well, we like this. We like that. Uh, you could work on your handles. They weren't wrong. Uh, I needed to work on my handles more. Um, I needed to pay attention to form. Uh, but they said the quality of the work at that time met the standards of the league. And that is the part that I love about the league. Everybody you see when you go to our virtual sites or where we are, we have standards. We are critical of what we do. So if you are a craftsman and you're willing to take that challenge and go forward, I would recommend going contact the league. See if you can become a member of the league or take their advice and then move forward and come back and prove to people that you have the knowledge to be a part of a system it is similar to a guild system. You have your beginners, you have your journeymen, and then you have your master craftsmen. And you want, and I, again, I would just recommend it if you have that quality in your work. So I've now put the edges on the pot. I'm going to now stamp it again. So this is a process that just gets repeated over and over to make a pie plate. Now, every time I make pie plates, they're a little bit different. I think this year I did uh, some pie plates that have swirls in them. Uh, I did these earlier in the year, and it's just flowers. Um, I've done them where there is large, gigantic, more petals to the flowers. So every time I do these, they do have a little bit different feel to them. So um, if you're looking for my pie plates and that, there is going to be a little difference to each one that I make. So. Be aware of that if you are ever interested in a pie plate. But what I will tell you is, I know my pie plates cook the crust all the way across the bottom. So you don't get that soggy bottom on your apple pie or your cherry pie or your rhubarb pie and that. Now before I didn't cut do this. I want to do this again because I want to make sure there is a bottom and there is. Now we can continue with the design. I love this part of it because uh, there's kind of a uniformity to it, uh, which is not normally me. Um, I love a good straight line. Uh, but I also know in clay, there's no such thing as a perfectly straight line unless you use a mold or some kind of curve and you clean it to that edge um, and that. So now we're back to the black slip. I'm just going to squeeze it on, fill in the big flowers. Repetition is the greatest way to learn anything. If you do not do repetition, it is really hard to make a good pot. It goes the same with math. It goes the same with 
any subject that you're learning. It is repetition. Um, I have students who love, by the way, I do tell all my students I talk about them. I will not use their names though. I love working with the students I have. I love the challenge of, I teach an advanced student class. I love the challenge to see what they're coming up with of their own ideas and then trying to help them and promote them to go forth and do that. Uh, and it's really fun when you see them succeed at it and make that object. Uh, it's really great. It's also sad though, once in a while they make this most ultimate object, and we just had this happen, sculptural piece a gentleman made, and when it came out of the kiln, the kiln gods won. It didn't make it. It was really neat because he pushed it beyond his usual norm. It was great. So you got to push the envelope once you learn how to be a potter and find a way to move forward with that. So this is, you know, this is what it's all about. Now I'm putting blue dots in the center. Of course, I have to get a needle, which I don't have. Do you have a needle? Uh, there's one over there. So we'll move on to another part and we'll do a little brown. And then just put the lines within. So there's a lot of education in pottery and that. There's a container full of pins. It's silver. We both have these spaces where we work and right now, this is right within Maureen. Maureen works on this side most of the time. I work on the other side of the barn, which, of course, is always in disarray in that. So this is my pin tin. It is an uh, old-fashioned thing. It does not like to open. So we will get it open. Don't use a needle because you'll stick it in your finger, which is what I was about ready to do. And there we go. So you get to watch me struggle with the can. It's rusting over time. Now the demonstration now is how to open up a pin jar without hurting yourself. Oh no, it's is there rusted. Another, is there another tin? No, there's another tin. Excuse me for one second. I will be right back. Okay, did Cobalt keep everybody interested? She's lying in the corner. I hope you can see her. Um, she is having, she is sleeping right now and going, they're talking about me again. That's what we love about cobalt. So I have a needle tool that, I mean, these are needle tools that, and I use a pin to unclog them. So now I'll go back to the blue and then we'll go back to the brown. Now again, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. I've just been reminded to tell you that you can see the pie plate, I believe, behind me, or you can go to our website, which is sliptrail.com, and you can see our pots there as well. Now, finish the brown before you get distracted. 
That was called commentary. And there we go. And now we'll put the white dots on. Like so. What I think is really fun about this also for me is that patterns like I, what I do now have been around forever. Flowers have been put on pots from the beginning of time. They were stamped onto the pots. They were drawn onto the pots. They were painted with onto the pots. And people used to love seeing that. They were made onto mosaic tiles that were put on buildings. Um, clay is an amazing material that can withstand the weather outdoors if you use the right clay and the right temperature to fire the pot to. So if you look at some of these old buildings, like a nice little building in Kittery that is made of brick, it's the Kittery Library, has these beautiful mosaic tiles up on the top part of the building and they were pressed into a mold and then fired and they've been there since the building has been built and people are still enjoying that building to this day. So if you think of uh, the human history, our human history is in clay. Uh, that's how we gauge cultures to be their technology is by how they fire clay or certain materials that reach a high temperature. So when you think about it, clay is an important storyteller of who we are and what we are. So it looks like our hour is almost up. So, um, I don't want to leave without saying, does anybody have a question? <laughs> Just in case, before I go. If not, I believe our website is sliptrail.com. Uh, please go take a look at that. Go to nhcrafts.org to either join the organization or become a patron of the organization. Um, our shop at the fair is there for us during the rest of the year. The league has stores all throughout New Hampshire. Not every craftsman is in every store, though, but most of us are in lots of the stores. So check it out. See what it is. Also, the league has puts on a gallery show at least four or more a year to go see. I would recommend doing that as well. And it's at their headquarters in Concord. And I believe there's two more shows coming up, but we're not sure if they're going to be virtual or real. So crafting, crafting is one, which is okay. up at the Capitol area where the league headquarters is, right? No. That's the one. Oh, it's going to be over at Great Bay College, uh, maybe in November, I believe it is. And then there is another show that was up at uh, League Headquarters Capital in Arts. Uh, Capital Arts, which is another show to go see. Uh, they're a lot of fun. Um, so I'm giving lots of talk here so you can give me that last question. Nope. Otherwise, thank you very much for joining us. I hope to see you all again and have